Good morning, everyone. It is Thursday, February the 13th, 2020. It is currently 10.32 a.m. Central Time. Well, this is part, what, I believe this is part five. Yeah, let me look really quick. I believe this is part five. I don't want to give you wrong information, uh, but I believe this is part five. I'm looking really quick. I know uh, I should have known this, but I, I don't want to give you the wrong one. Yes, this is part five of a mini series that I am calling Understanding Difficult Bible Passages. All right, part five. We began this mini series on Sunday at Victory Baptist Church, where I spent over an hour looking at Ezra chapter nine and Ezra chapter 10. Now, how, why did we start this series? What's, what's kind of the goal for this mini series? Well, let me remind you, if you, if you missed part one, part two, part three, and part four, let me remind you what is going on. On Friday of last week, I received an email from the Discover the Word podcast. Every Friday, they send out an email saying, hey, this is what we're going to be covering in the, in, in, in the week to come. Um, and here's a little study guide. So go ahead and start looking at it and get ready for our week, you know, the, what we're going to cover in the week to come. All right. So I get the email from the Discover the Word podcast on Friday. And in that email, well, I found this. Let me read it directly to you. Have you ever struggled with some of the things you find in the Bible? There are situations in Scripture that are hard to comprehend in today's context. The book of Ezra contains a perfect example of a difficult passage that can sound cruel and unchristlike to us. In Ezra chapter 10, Ezra prayed about cross-cultural marriages and instructed the men to get rid of their wives and children. Why? This week, we're back to basics as the Discover the Word team explores the question, how do we read what we don't understand in the Old Testament? How do we understand what we don't understand in the Old Testament? That is the question they set out to answer. And they were going to dig into Ezra chapter 10 and try to help us understand this very difficult Bible passage. Now, I'm going to lean over here. I'm going to pick up my Bible because I'll probably need it here in a second. Let me, let me remind you, if, if you didn't hear everything, or even if you did, let me kind of just remind you of how this is all developed as we try to move this discussion forward um, in this episode. On Sunday, we, ju- we kind of jumped the gun, all right? We, we decided, look, the, the Discover the Word podcast will air on Monday. It's Sunday. Let's jump in with both feet and let, let's, let's see what we can do here at Victory Baptist Church to address this difficult passage. So we dug into Ezra chapter 10. We went back to Ezra chapter 9. We looked, up, uh, we looked up some background information in a Bible dictionary, and I think we did a pretty good job with trying to address the difficulty of the passage. I, I think we did a pretty good job. We, we tried to address the issue from the perspective that the solution they came up with, the, 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 the men of Israel, they had married these women who were pagans. They were not, they were not supposed to do this. They had specific, there were specific rules given to them not to marry these uh, pagan women. They violated the rule. There was sin. Um, Ezra is upset about it. He prays, he confesses, and, and a solution is, is offered up, a solution to this problem. And the, and the solution is put away the women. We went from the perspective that this solution, um, what either A, came from God, God gave them the solution, or two, God at least approved of the solution. That's, that's the perspective we went, and then we tried to find a way to understand that using Ezra chapter 9 and Ezra chapter 10. Now, the Discover the Word um, b- uh, podcast they took a different approach. Their argument is this solution to put away the women did not come from God. They came up with it, and they pretty much implied that their solution was wrong. In fact, I think Tuesday's episode of the Discover the Word podcast was called Two Wrongs Don't Make a Right, all right? So they went from the perspective, hey, this was wrong. When they came up with the solution, this was wrong. And you can read Ezra chapter 10. I was going to read it right now, but for time's sake, 
I'm not going to read it again. We'll probably get into the text here in a minute. But they went from that perspective. Okay, they, they have made some decent arguments for that perspective. They didn't really go in depth, but they at least made, you know, some decent arguments. But you really need to dig into the, the whole issue of who came up with the solution probably better than they did. But to be fair, they only have 15 minutes for each episode. All right, so that gets us to yesterday. Now, when the program ended yesterday, on the uh, as we were listening to the Discover the Word podcast, they made a statement that today, Thursday, and tomorrow, Friday, that they're going to look at how to apply this, this story in Ezra chapter 10. And, and this is the point you have to remember before we continue. Their interpretation of Ezra chapter 10 basically says, look, they repented of their wrong, but then they committed another wrong to deal with it. Now, that's pretty much the interpretation they gave. Now, if that is true, their application of the story must be consistent with their interpretation. Your application must come from your interpretation. You can't interpret the passage and then come up with an application that goes contrary to your interpretation. So that's what we're going to listen carefully today to see. If the, if it is true that they're going to apply the text today, we're going to find out if they are consistent. Now, to be fair, and, and for those who do not know, I haven't listened to this in advance. I when I got the notification last night, I was like, oh, I want to listen, I want to listen, I want to listen, I want to see how they apply this, but I like this to be very organic, like we're listening to it together. We're reacting at the same time. There's nothing rehearsed. So my reactions are real. They're not, you know, uh, you know, I'm not acting. And so um, I, I like to do it this way better. So I've been waiting since last night to hear this. I'm very curious, I'm very curious to see if their application is going to be consistent with their interpretation. So are you ready to dig back in? If you have a Bible, open it to Ezra chapter 10. Here we go. We're going we're gonna to see what we can learn. I, I, I've enjoyed this. I've enjoyed this series. I don't know if anyone else has, but I have, I have enjoyed this because uh, it's caused me to really think about Ezra chapter 10, really think about Ezra chapter 9, really dig in. And, and that's, that's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians, not only reading the Bible, studying the Bible, thinking about the Bible, meditating on the Bible. And that's, that's what we've done this week. And hopefully you have participated and you have really gotten something out of it. But let's see where they go today. Here we go. The Discover the Word podcast. It is their, their part four. I think that's what was confusing me. It is their part four, our part five. And the reason it's our part five is because we started on Sunday, right? And they started on Monday. All right, here we go. The Discover the Word podcast. Let's listen carefully. Today on Discover the Word, we're going to learn another important principle that will help us when we're reading the Bible, especially the Old Testament. And uh, here is how Bill Crowder will get Mark DeHaan and Elisa Morgan and Daniel Ryan Day into this conversation. Okay, this is going to be kind of an odd question, which I'm sure stuns you. <laughs> From you? <laughs> that I would ask an odd question. <laughs> so I'm going to go with yes ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever experienced something that you kind of felt was for you, even though it wasn't really to you? Huh. Oh, it's all about me. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. That's a good answer, Mark. Yeah, so pull your chair up to the table with the group as they explore how this distinction of being to us and for us is an important one to keep in mind when we read the Bible. Day four of our series, Reading the Old Testament, is coming up next on Discover the Word. And it is time to get the group back together and continue our week of conversations called Reading the Old Testament here on Discover the Word. Now this week, Bill and Mart, and Elisa and Daniel have been using a really difficult story in the Old Testament book of Ezra as the foundation for listing out some Bible reading and Bible study techniques for understanding some of the many things in the Old Testament that are just problematic for us. And so they will review what is so tough about this story in Ezra in just a moment, and then they'll explain how and when applying this principle about discerning when things are not written to us 
can be for us. And so to begin, Bill wants to share a story about his son Andy and his daughter-in-law Katie's wedding. That is an example of this that should help us begin to process how we can benefit from something. It can be for us, even if it isn't directed to us, and how that applies to reading the Old Testament. All right, Bill. When our son Andy got married, Andy's a worship pastor in a church, and he's a musician. And for the wedding ceremony, he wrote a song to his wife Mm -hmm. and sang it as part of the wedding ceremony. I think everybody there sensed the goodness and the rightness of that, even though he was only singing to one person. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, sure. Isn't that true of all great drama? How do you mean? You find yourself in the story somewhere. Mm. That's good, yeah. Okay, this is about somebody else, but oh, man. Yes, we get connected in yeah. some way. Yeah. yeah, we see ourselves there. That's yeah. good. Yeah, we've talked about that even with stories in the Bible, that one of the, in the New Testament, when you're reading something in the Gospels about Jesus and these people and these people and these people, and you try to find yourself, which group do you most identify with in mm-hmm. that story? Or maybe... How might you at different times identify with each group in the story? And it's kind of a good exercise. Mm-hmm. It brings the Bible alive. Yeah, it does. It shifts yeah. your perspective. Yeah. yeah. So I would like to suggest that that idea is kind of another one of these handrails we can grab onto when we're dealing with a difficult text in the Old Testament. Mm. We've talked about a couple of things already that can help us as we navigate through difficult texts like Ezra 10, 1 through 5, that we've been looking at all week. What are some of the things that we've seen so far that can help us as we're trying to figure out a passage like this? You nailed a huge one in our last conversation. Is a passage descriptive? Does it describe what was happening so that Mm -hmm. we have a clear version of history, so to speak? Or is it prescriptive, giving Mm -hmm. us a way to live or respond? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we also looked at the fact that we're reading other people's mail, Mm -hmm. and not just other people, people that were very different from us in a different culture at a different time in history (laughs) with very different pressures and experiences in life than sometimes we can even imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's important that you say that, Daniel, because if we're honest, we can say that even how the Bible has been applied in our own culture has changed over the last hundred years in a variety of different ways. And I think what we recognize is cultures change. Truth, and more importantly than that, God doesn't change. But we need to be very careful how we separate what is timeless from what is time-bound. Just think how many of us have identified with the stories of people who have been helped by Jesus. I mean, all the way to the cross mm-hmm. and the, mm-hmm. the center next to him. And Jesus says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, all he did is reached out to the right person. Mm-hmm. And I think, well, God's going to treat us that way too. If our heart, even in the simplest, without a whole lot of understanding mm-hmm. or insight, but we reach out for his mercy. Mm-hmm. So as Jesus spoke to that thief, yeah. that dying criminal on the cross next to his cross. He timelessly speaks to our heart. Yeah. Right. Even though he's not speaking directly to us, it is something that is deeply for yeah. us. Yeah. And that's where, once again, we come to the scriptures, and we're going to look at our test case again today and give a, another principle, because we've seen that this is a different culture. We've seen not only a different culture, but it's a people group that's under a different covenant. Yes a covenant of law as opposed to grace that we're under. Where they had to do it right in order to be reconciled with God. And then the descriptive prescriptive. And today we're going to look at the to us versus for us. Now, let me jump in here. This uh, not to us, but for us principle. Yes, uh, we when we open the Bible, we read text uh, that were not written to us. But we do believe that they were for us. But we have to make sure we draw a distinction here. They are for us as possibly serving as an example. They are for us as in the words are supposed to be profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for rebuke. But we have to be extremely careful because there are times in the Bible where we read of promises that were for us. Uh, that were to a specific people, and those promises are not for us, all right? So this principle, there's a limit to this principle. If a promise is given in the Bible 
to a specific individual or specific group of people. We can't come on and go, well, it was to them, but it's for us. No, that promise was for to them and for them. Now, we may learn something about God, his mercy. He's giving this promise to these people. Um, clearly, this is grace. They don't deserve this promise etc., etc. We may learn some principles about God. We may learn some principles about God making a promise and keeping a promise, but the promise is not for us. Again, when you go to the book of Jeremiah and he's speaking to those in Babylonian captivity and he's like, I know the plans I have for you to bless you, etc., etc. How many times that people take that passage from Jeremiah and want to apply it to their lives? I'm like, you're not in Babylonian captivity. That's not, that not, that is not, it is not to you and it is not for for you in the sense that you claim that promise for your life. Now, you can learn from it, but that's it's not to you and it's not for you in that direct way. Again, I've told the story countless times. I'll tell it again. Um, I worked with a woman. Uh, she, she could not have a baby. She was very upset about the fact that she could not have a baby. She continued to pray about it. And then one morning she was reading in Genesis and she saw God's promise to Abraham and Sarah. And uh, she came to work and saying, God spoke to me this morning in his word and he gave me a promise. And I'm like, well, where did he speak to you from? And she showed me the passage. I'm like, your name is not Sarah. Your husband's name's not Abraham. This is promise is not to you. This promise is not for you you, okay? You've got to learn how to handle the Bible. Now, she got extremely upset, but I mean, she was claiming a promise that had nothing to do with her. So, make sure we get this. Yes, when we open the Bible, we're reading things that are not written to us. However, in certain ways, they are for us, but there is a limit to that, and we need to be very careful. I am still very curious what they're going to do with Ezra chapter 10. I'm still very curious, What? how are they going to make this for us? What lessons are they going to take from this? How are they going to apply the text? And remember, what I'm looking at is, this is very important, is their application, is it consistent with their interpretation? That's, we're, we're looking at this in a, in a very important way. Okay, so let, let's go back and hear what they have to say. We couch all of this just so that there's no mistake with a very, very high view of Scripture. Yeah. Deeply grateful for this gift that God has inspired and given to us yeah. to reveal us things about us and yeah. to reveal to us things about himself. So let's go back to our test case and just somebody real quickly net this out mm -hmm. for us. What's happened up to Ezra 10? And the people have been in exile and now they're coming back from Babylon to Jerusalem. Yeah. They came back and it was a city in disrepair and a people that felt in disrepair. And they're trying to figure out the what now? We've just come out of mm -hmm. Babylon. How do we follow God again? A God that maybe we've lost track of a little bit, a God that we don't remember real well. And Ezra's teaching them about this God again. And so they're trying to respond to that. And so they're in this group setting and praying and one of them, Shechaniah, yeah. you know, suggest that maybe the issue they feel far away from God is that in Israel's absence, people have begun to intermarry with different faiths. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he comes up with a solution. He thinks it's all that in a bag of chips. Yeah. What he says to Ezra is, we've been unfaithful to our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. Yet now there's hope. Well, where's the hope? Well, here's the hope. Let us now make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and their children. So um, it's not much hope for the wives and children. No. no. And so you look at that and you say, okay, well, first of all, thankfully, we're under a different covenant. And thankfully, this is a passage that we can clearly see is describing an event that happened in history, not giving us instructions on what we are to do, right? Now, I have to jump in because they, they've made this a central part of their argument. Hey, this is in the old covenant. Aren't we glad we're not in the old covenant? L let's make this very clear. If they came up with this solution, if they came up with this solution, God is not involved in this in any way, shape, or form. He did not tell them to do it. He did not support it. Then This has nothing to do with them being uh, under the old covenant. This has nothing to do with them being under the old covenant. This would be them 
hey, we're in sin, we need a solution, and they came up with a solution. The solution didn't come from the laws of the Old Covenant. Where did, where did they get the solution from? Now, they carry out their solution of putting away the women according to the law found in Deuteronomy about how to put away um, your spouse, how to basically, uh, how to, to divorce them. So they, they carry out the solution according to that law, but the, the law of putting these women away is that a part of the old covenant? If so, then you would have to say they didn't come up with the idea. They took the idea from scripture. They, they, they took the idea from God. Well, that's not been shown so far in this week of discussion. So I'm already getting, they keep going back to, hey, they were in the old covenant. All right, we're not in the new, we're in the new covenant. So this has nothing to do with us. Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down, slow down, slow down. Their solution has nothing to do with them being under the old covenant unless you are arguing that the solution came from the laws of the old covenant. I've yet to see that being produced because the minute you say that, then you can't say the solution was wrong. You would have to say the solution is from God. So which is it? I don't know why they keep going to this. See, that, that's the old covenant. We're in the new covenant. We're in the new covenant. Okay, I understand we're in the new covenant. I understand they were under the old covenant. Okay, so what's your point? Okay, because their solution didn't come, has nothing to do with them being under the old covenant. It was a, it was people who realized they had sinned and they were like, what do we do? And why were they facing this? Remember my points, remember my principles, because when you sin, you create a situation that is very difficult to resolve, all right? And if, this is a second point I've been emphasizing, if they came up with a solution and if this is their solution and if we view the solution wrong, then the lesson we can uh, learn from this is very simple. When we sin, we are to ensure that we don't commit another sin and trying to fix the previous sin. That would be the application. So far, what they're doing is, hey, Old covenant, we're new covenant. Hey, hey, this is descriptive. It's not prescriptive. So, okay, I get all of that. But that, what we need to know is, was was their solution wrong? If it was, then we have a specific application for it. If it was right, then we have a different application for it. But I, I don't know why they keep trying to draw this distinction. Hey, that was under the old covenant. Okay. I, I don't, I, I'm going to repeat myself, but I, I won't. I won't. I'll stop right there. I think I've made my point very clear. If, if, if for some reason you're confused by this point, email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, and I will, I will try to work, I'll try to walk you through it because I think this is very important. I, I, I don't understand why they keep drawing this distinction. What they did, either it was right, if it was right, then God ordained it. And then you could say God ordained this and God gave them this information because uh, they were operating under the old covenant and this would be something done under the old covenant. But if you're going to make the argument God had nothing to do with this, then this has nothing to do with them being under the old covenant. This is a group of people who are committing a sin and trying to fix their previous sin. That is the, the story. But Let's see. I'm going to give them every opportunity to try to give us an application that is consistent with their interpretation. That is what we're trying to find. Uh, I'm, get, I'm getting a little worried because they're running out of time quickly because these programs are very short. So let's see where they go. Here we go. Now, today we want to add, how can this be for us, even though it's not to us? And how can we know that it's not to us? Okay. So to help us with the how can we know, Elisa, I would ask you to get 1 Corinthians 7, verses 12 and 13. Now, what do we know about 1 Corinthians? Paul loves that church very much yeah. and refers to God as our God at the very beginning mm -hmm. of the letter. And so he wants them to know, hey, I'm in this with mm -hmm. you. And this is what it looks like to live out this faith in Jesus mm -hmm. that you say you believe, both by correcting bad action, but also by living into mm -hmm. the fullness that Christ had for them. Now, without getting too deep into the details, if you look at the people in Ezra's situation and the people in Corinth, they're two very similar situations. There are people living in difficult times and in very difficult circumstances and surroundings and environments. And at the heart of both of those challenges hmm. are some marriage concerns, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So here in Ezra's case, Shechaniah, not the Lord, Shechaniah suggests 
okay, the only way to fix this is to get rid of these wives. Mm -hmm. Notice how differently Paul counsels the church at Corinth. Did you catch that? Uh, Did you catch that, if I can speak right? Did you catch that? Shechaniah came up with this, not the Lord. That is their interpretation. That's the one they're driving home. So according to them, now, and this is very important to get, God did not come up with this solution. And no way, no shape, no form, no how, God was not involved in this. This is what they came up with. Now, they still haven't stated if what they came up with was wrong. If it was wrong, then their application has to be connected to that. So they've made it now, they've explicitly made it clear that Shechaniah came up with the solution. God was not involved. So I don't know what that has to do with the old covenant. That's, that's number one. Number two, I am fascinated that they're going to 1 Corinthians 7. I am, I am fascinated here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested how they're going to work this, all right? Um, I think I think what they're going to do is, hey, this is the solution they came up with in Ezra 10. For us, when we're dealing with a somewhat of a similar situation, we follow 1 Corinthians 7. That would be the instruction to us. Uh, Ezra 10 was to them. 1 Corinthians uh, 7 will, will be more f- uh, for us or to us. I, I think that's kind of where they're going. But I am interesting. I, 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 to be fair, um, I hadn't thought about bringing in 1 Corinthians 7 in light of Ezra 10. And now I'm kind of kicking myself that I missed this concept. And this is why you listen to uh, to as much preaching as possible and listen and read because you're always challenged. Even if you don't, have, I mean, I'm, obviously I'm disagreeing with uh, some of the ways they're approaching this, but this is an interesting concept. So they've only got like five minutes. So man, I wish they had longer, but let's see what they do with this because uh, this may lead after we conclude this series um, we may then have to come back and spend some time working on 1 Corinthians 7. I've, I went verse by verse through 1 Corinthians years ago. It took us, I think, three, four years to finish the book. So I've covered this section, um, but I, I always throw out my old teaching when I look at it again. So we're going to look at this anew, and we're going to see what they have to, how they're going to handle this. I'm very interested, so let's pay close attention. Who had... Buku problems. They were broken yeah. too. Their relationships were messed up just exactly. like the relationships. And they were messed up spiritually in terms of too many gods and being involved. That's right. right. Okay. So listen to the counsel he gives in verses 12 and 13 of 1 Corinthians 7. Elisa? To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she's willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he's willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. Now, there are a couple of things about that are really important. One is, first of all, this is balanced because it's coming at it from both sides of the man and the woman, Mm -hmm. which is very different from the Ezra 10 passage, right? right? And the second thing is where in Ezra 10, it's almost like if we're going to be spiritually pure again, we've got to get rid of these unbelieving pagan wives and kids. Yeah. And Paul says just the opposite. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. says, if the unbelieving wants to stay, let him stay. And isn't it interesting that we read Ezra 10 as if it's thus saith the Lord when it's Shechaniah's idea. Mm-hmm. But here Paul begins, it is I, not the Lord. Yeah. I'm suggesting this. He's just suggesting it under the guidance of his understanding of who God is. But it's interesting. Yeah, both of them were trying mm-hmm. uh-huh. to speak in behalf of the mm-hmm. Lord, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And I think what's so compelling about this is that this passage in Ezra 10 can be for us, but clearly it's not to us in the same way this First Corinthians 7 passage is, because this is all about grace. Mm-hmm. This is new covenant. This That's is right. the influence mm-hmm. of, of yeah. Jesus who has revealed the heart of the Father, and given us another way of fulfilling our spirituality, our Great relationship. Great freedom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jesus gives us a... All right, they keep drawing this distinction between Old Covenant and New Covenant. Now, now, whoa, this is opening up a can of worms. This, this is opening up a mess. Okay, so, and Ezra 10, according to their understanding, this is Shechaniah. It's not the Lord, Shechaniah. And then in 1 Corinthians 7, it seems to be, again, but to the rest, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 7, 12, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. 
So how do we understand 12 and 13? How do we understand this? Do we understand this as simply Paul's suggestion? Do we understand this as that he was not writing those words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? So that do they have any authority? Are they binding in any way, shape, or form? Or is it simply another attempt for us to try to resolve this problem? Again, I'm going to read it again. 1 Corinthians 7, 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Now, how do we understand that? Does that have any authority? Or is this just a suggestion? Is it just a, because Paul says, hey, I'm speaking this, not the Lord. Is that an acknowledgement that this was not written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Paul wrote it, and then God and God in his providence ensured that it was preserved for us in the scripture. How, how do we understand those words? This raises a whole different issue, and they're just throwing. This is where this is where um, I, I can get very frustrated with a little fifteen minute program because I mean you've just opened up a thousand questions, and they've got like three minutes left. All right, so they're they're saying, hey, the the the, the Ezra passage that's old covenant. Here in 1 Corinthians 7, this is new covenant. Now we see the influence of Jesus. We see the influence of grace. Well, Okay, maybe, but if it's just Paul's words, what ma- what does it matter? And if it's just Ezra, if it's just Shechaniah's words, what does it matter? You're seeing two individuals trying to fix a, sol- a problem, and the problem is we are not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. We're not to marry an unbeliever. Once that happens, what do we do? All right, well, 1 Corinthians 7, is this just Paul offering his suggestion? And Ezra 10, is it just Shechaniah offering his his suggestion? I, I don't know, but the, these are important questions. Let's go back and see what they do with this. Precedent for that a few times too, because oftentimes he's noted as saying, you've heard yeah. in the law mm. this, but I say. Yeah. And so here we have an example of Shechaniah and Ezra saying something, but then we see the new covenant, which says, yes, but I say. Mm. Mm. And it's filled with grace. That's right. We've been talking all week about this progression of ideas on how we read a difficult Old Testament text. And today I'm going to leave us a little bit open-ended on purpose. (laughs) Because we've seen how clearly 1 Corinthians 7 can speak under a covenant of grace. That still doesn't answer the question of how Ezra 10 can be for us. And I want to save that idea as we close our conversations tomorrow. Because it's maybe the biggest idea of all. So uh, make plans to join us here again tomorrow because I'm sure you've been wrestling all this week with, you know, how is something like this profitable? And what do we do with this difficult story from the book of Ezra? We're going to tackle that question next time. And I'm intrigued to find out what that biggest idea of all is that, uh, that Bill mentioned. You're with Marty Hahn, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day here on Discover the Word. And we are in day four of our series titled, Reading the Old Testament. Well, I think you can tell that our entire team, including all of those who work behind the scenes, are passionate about fulfilling Discover the Word's mission of making the life-changing wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to people all around the world. Now, for more years than any of us have been working here, for more than 80 years, God has supplied what we need at this ministry through the voluntary contributions of friends like you who share our passion. We started telling the story of Jesus back in 1938 on the radio as Radio Bible Class. And today we invite you to support this ministry by making a donation. Every gift, no matter the size, will make a difference. You can make your contribution by going online to our website at discovertheword.org. Click on the Donate button on the top right side of the page, and then we'll walk you through your options and how to give. And then don't forget to go online and check out our new featured resource I've been talking about this week. It's the book, Fearfully and Wonderfully, The Marvel of Bearing God's Image by Dr. Paul Brand and Philip Yancey. Now, Philip Yancey will be here with us on Discover the Word next week. 
pretty excited about that. Okay, I'm not going to play the, the their commercial at the end. I've done it all week. I'm, I'm not going to do it again because I just want to get back to to this issue. All right. So, according to them, this is kind of, it's kind of weird the way they do this. Hey, the old covenant. We got the old covenant in Ezra. We got the new covenant in First Corinthians seven, and in, and many times in in the new covenant, we'll get you know it, uh, you have heard or it was written, but I say unto you. Okay, that's. That's when Jesus is uh, changing or adding or doing something. That's when Jesus steps in. I don't know how that relates to what Paul is doing here in 1 Corinthians 7. I, I, I really don't know. I, in fact, that's a little concerning that they would draw that I, idea. Uh, so let me read 1 Corinthians 7, tw- uh, 12 again. But to the rest speak I, this is Paul, not the Lord. All right, this is not in any way borrowing from the idea where Jesus would say it you have heard or it was written but I say unto you this that no that's not he's not saying hey you have heard or it was written no this is Paul clearly just saying but to the rest speak I not the Lord so he he's going to step in and give his his thoughts his opinion on this I, I pulled up uh, just a couple of commentaries really quick and this is uh just one the very first one I pulled up Let me read this to you. The apostle has no word of Christ to quote on this point, it being one which did not arise during our Lord's life. It is to be noticed that the apostle, in giving his own apostolic instruction on this point, does not use the word command, which he applied to our Lord's teaching, but the less authoritative speak. I speak unto you, not that I command you, not that I instruct you, not that I direct you, but I simply speak to you. I'm going to give you my thoughts. So is it authoritative? So do we draw a correlation between Ezra and 1 Corinthians? And listen, here would be the correlation. In both cases, people sinned by marrying unbelievers. In both situations, in both cases, now you have a situation where you, like, once you want to repent of what you have done, what do you do? How do you handle it? All right. In Ezra's case, they put away the women. In, in Paul's case, he says, hey, if the unbeliever wants to stay, do not put them away. All right. It, but that's just Paul's advice. What, what would be the teaching? What would be the right way to handle it? I think typically we would say that the overall, the overall message from Genesis to Revelation is that you're not to dissolve a marriage. You're not to break up a marriage. Uh, God hates the putting away. He hates divorce. You're not to do this. Uh, what, you know, what uh, God has put together, let no man put asunder. Uh, you know, uh, and all the different, we could go from scripture to scripture to scripture, which clearly uh, would prohibit and condemn divorce. So 1 Corinthians 7, this is Paul's advice, right? 1 Corinthians 7 seems to be Paul's advice. Ezra, we see the advice of Shechaniah. So how do, I don't know, they're, they're acting like, look, man, that Ezra passage, that's old covenant, that's harsh, that's law. But man, this 1 Corinthians 7 passage, this is grace, this is this is the influence of Jesus, or is just the advice of Paul, <laughs> right? That seems to have. Does, what authority does it even have? See, they they're not even addressing that issue. They're almost like First Corinthians seven. That's for us. That's to us. Well, no, it's just Paul giving advice. Is it for me? Is it to me? Do I have to follow it? Well, why? Why would they? Why? So I'm going to stick with my, um, I'm going to, I'm going to continue to, re, to, to emphasize this over and over and over and over again, because um, I think my application of this, I'm trying to be as consistent with the text as possible. So I'm going to continue to offer my, and my application, and then you can, you can compare mine to what they have done on the Discover the Word program. Here is, I'm going to drive this point home, right? Two points. Number one, when we sin, we create situations that are sometimes impossible to come up with a solution, with a biblical solution, because in many cases, the Bible doesn't tell us what to do after we sin. Yeah, it tells us to repent, tells us to confess, but in some cases, it doesn't give us the clear instructions. Okay, what do you do now? 
Okay, what, what can you do now? What, what, what are the consequences? People say this all the time. Uh, yes, there is forgiveness for our sins, but there are consequences to our sins. Yeah, but what, what's the consequences? What do we do? How long do we endure the consequences? Who enforces the consequences? Because everyone has an opinion of what should be done to someone after they've sinned, what, what consequences they should face, what they should do to make it right. Can they make it right? Sometimes that's just us coming up with our own solutions. Sin creates situations that are sometimes almost impossible to resolve. I'm going to continue to drive that point home. And point number two, if it is true, that what they did in Ezra 10, if we go with the idea that it was wrong, then let me drive this point home. We cannot sin in our attempts to fix or make right our previous sin. Once we sin, we don't commit another sin to fix the first sin. All right. We that's not the way we are, we are to avoid sin in an attempt to correct a previous sin. That is what we have to avoid. Those, to me, seems to be two biblically grounded applications of the interpretation that has been offered up this week in these programs. 1 Corinthians 7, I mean, that, that, that requires an entirely different program. That, that, that requires an entirely, a, a new week of programs. How, how do we handle 1 Corinthians 7? Here's what I would challenge you to do. Look up 1 Corinthians 7. Let me give you the right verse. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12. Look up at least five commentaries. What do they do with that? How, how authoritative do they believe Paul's words are to be? How do they, what do they tell us to do with them? Do they see them as simply a suggestion? They're not a command. They're not a directive. They obviously don't come from God. So can we ignore them? How do we understand that? Look, look that up, and then, and then you can draw in your own mind, how does this relate to Ezra? How does this relate to Ezra? The only connection I, be, I see between Ezra and 1 Corinthians is you've got a, a case where people have sinned, and you've got, in, in Ezra's case, Shechaniah, and in the 1 Corinthians case, Paul, both trying to come up with a solution, trying to tell people what to do. Paul doesn't even, it doesn't even make a reference to Ezra 10. So do we even draw them as a correlation? Do we even cross-reference them? Do they, how do they even connect? All right, so kind of frustrating. I, I really thought they were going to go, that the way they talked yesterday, that they were going to go into more application and, and they, they, really, they really haven't. So they've got one day left. They got tomorrow, tomorrow. So we will see their, 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 their podcast will drop around seven or eight o'clock tonight. And once again, I'm going to be tempted to listen to see if they're going to really wrap this up in a good way. Uh, but this has kind of been a little frustrating in how they've handled this text. But you can let me know what you think. Email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. I hopefully you've enjoyed this. Uh, now you've got Ezra 10 to consider, 1 Corinthians 7 to consider. Hopefully this is getting you, dig, hopefully this is motivating you to dig into the scriptures to try to resolve and try to find a way to understand a difficult biblical passage. We should be willing to ask questions. We should be willing to struggle. And that's the beauty of our, our, our spiritual walk. We have God's word to, to wrestle with, to, to, to struggle with, to, to try to figure out what the truth is and to ensure that we understand it correctly, interpret it correctly, and apply it correctly. All right, plenty for you to think on. Let me know what you think. And again, you can email me at newsif at yahoo.com. All right, everyone have a great Thursday. May God bless you as you study his word.